Hello and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to get started with JTK4 with Rust. And during the course of the video, we'll take a look at how to create windows and add widgets to them. We'll also take a look at how to add event handlers to widgets and some basic layouts as well as some basic state management. So if that sounds interesting to you, then keep watching and let's get started. So let's start with a new cargo project and we'll call this JTK demo. And then we can see the into the directory and then add the only crate that we need for now, which is the JTK library. So the first thing that we need to do is bring in the JTK prelude. And the reason for this is because a lot of methods in JTK aren't methods that are inherently on structs. So what I mean by that is widgets like the button, for example, don't have a set label method on the struct itself, but the method itself is provided by a trait called button ext. And this is also true for many of the other widgets. So that's why we need the prelude in scope. We also need a few other structs in scope. So the first is the application struct and this struct is responsible for the application loop. So it manages things like windows and the application's lifecycle. So by lifecycle, I mean when the application starts up or when it shuts down. We also need an application window and this is a top level widget that gets added to the app and we can have multiple windows added to the app. And on the windows themselves, we can add child widgets such as labels, text fields and buttons. And then finally, we'll add a button widget so that we can create a basic counter to increment a number and display that number in the terminal. And now we can start developing our application. So to do this, we're going to use the application struct and use the builder method to return an application builder. And using the application builder, we can configure the application. So here I'm setting the application's ID to a unique ID using a reverse domain name style. So there doesn't seem to be a whole lot more that you can do with the application builder apart from set some flags. So in this case, we'll just go with the application ID and build the application using the build method. Okay, so now on the application instance, we need to call the connect activate method. And this method takes a closure that gets run when the application is activated. Now the connect activate method is a subscriber method and it subscribes to events. So in this case, this particular method is subscribing to an event called activate. And so we can call the connect activate method multiple times with different closures and those closures will get queued up and run in sequence when the application is run. Now the closure here takes a single argument and it's a reference to the application instance and that's good for us because then we don't have to clone it to move it into the closure. And this is quite common in JTK where a closure will take a reference to a widget or an object that triggered it. And so it just makes it a lot more easier for the closure to interact with that object or widget. Okay, so finally we call the run method on the application and this will dispatch the application and go through its lifecycle. And one of the events that it's going to call is the activate event. Okay, so now we have an application instance and if we were to run the code at this point, then nothing's going to happen. And that's because we need an application window. So here I'm creating a window using the application window struct and notice that the new function takes a reference to the application. I'm also setting a default size for the window and giving it a title. Now there are other properties that we can set on the window such as maximizing the window by default, but for now we'll just go with these two properties. Okay, so the last thing that we need to do is call the show method on the window and this will make the window visible when we run the program. So what we should see is a window like this that can then be resized. Okay, so so far so good, we now have a window. Let's go ahead and add a button to it so that we can create this counter. So adding a button is just as simple as creating an application window. So here I'm using the button struct to create a new button widget. Now one thing to mention here is that the button doesn't take a reference to the application like the application window does. And that's because we're going to add the button to the window which already has a reference to the application. Now on the button, we need to add a connect clicked method so that we can subscribe to the buttons click event. And this method takes a closure with a reference to the button. Now, most of the time you'll find that you don't really have a use for this argument. That is of course, unless you wanted to mutate the button in some particular way. So finally, what we have to do is add the button to the window and we can do that using the window set child method. Okay, so now let's go ahead and see what this produces. So here you can see that we have a button, but it's occupying the full space of the window. So to solve this, we can use a layout and JTK4 has quite a few layouts that we can use. And one of the simplest layouts is to use the box layout. The box layout is a container widget. And as the name suggests, it contains child widgets and child widgets are organized either vertically or horizontally. And we can set this orientation in the new function. So now we can go ahead and add the button to the layout and then we can add the layout to the window. So let's go ahead and see what this produces. So here we can see that the button has now aligned itself to the top and that's telling us that we have a box container, but what's happened is that the button has actually expanded and filled the entire container. Now on the box container, there isn't a method to set the alignment of child elements. Instead, what we have to do is set the alignment on each individual child element. So here I'm setting the button's H align, which is the horizontal alignment to align start. And this will align the button to the left of the container. 
And so for each widget that we add to the container, we would have to set the horizontal alignment if we didn't want that widget to expand and fill the entire container. Now in this example, the box layout's orientation is set to vertical, which means that when we add child elements to the container, those child elements will appear vertically, but the horizontal alignment will be whatever we set it to. So for example, if we added another widget to the container and we set the horizontal alignment to align end, then that will make that widget appear under the button, but on the right side of the container. Okay, so now we have a basic idea on how to use the box widget to construct basic layouts. So let's go ahead and continue with the counter example. Okay, so here's where things get a little bit tricky because the closure that we provide to the buttons click method needs to be a static closure, which means that the closure has to own all of its data. So what that essentially means is that we can't create a global counter variable of type integer, for example, and then try to use that variable in the closure. Because if we did that, the counter variable being of type integer will simply just get copied over into the closure. And so the closure will maintain a new variable. And so modifying that variable wouldn't have an effect on the global variable. Now let's take a look at a simple example to understand this a little bit better. So here we have a mutatable variable called x with an initial value of zero, and the closure will take the value of x and increment it. So if we run this code, what we should see is one printed to the terminal. Now the reason why this works is because the closure captures the x variable as a mutatable reference, so it doesn't actually own the x variable. But now look what happens when we put the move keyword on the closure. So this is a static closure, and it means that the closure must own all of its data. So now the x variable will get copied into the closure and the closure will maintain a separate copy of that variable. So the x variable inside the closure and the x variable outside of the closure are two different variables. So now if we run the code again, what we should see is that the x variable still holds its original value and it hasn't been modified by the closure. Okay, so to solve this in our JTK application, we need to use the RC struct type and the RC struct type will give us a way to have shared ownership over some data. Now the RC struct type gives us immutable access to some data, so we can't actually use it to mutate data. So for that, we're going to have to use either a cell or a ref cell. So in this example, we'll use a ref cell to store an integer value, and then we can get a mutatable reference to that value to increment it. So all we have to do now is to initialize an RC that has shared access to a ref cell that will hold our counter value. And then all we need to do is clone the RC and move the clone into the button clicks closure. So to do that, we just have to put the move keyword in the closure and now the closure can take ownership of the RC count clone. So here I'm calling the borrow mut method on the ref cell and this will return a ref mut smart pointer. And this smart pointer is a guard that holds our i32 counter value. Now, in order to update the counter, we need to dereference the ref mut smart pointer to get a mutatable reference to the counter. So then once we have the mutatable reference, we then have to dereference it one more time so that we can actually update the counter. So that's two dereferences that we have to do just to update the counter. But we can simplify this process by dereferencing the RC clone in one statement like this. So here basically deref coercion is taking place. So everything in the chain is being dereferenced. But not only that, the guard is also being dropped at the end of the statement. And so because the guard has been dropped, we can then get an immutable reference to the data. Because remember, we can't have both an immutable reference and a mutable reference at the same time. Okay, so let's go ahead and test what we have so far. So here in the terminal, we should see the count increment every time I click on the count button. Okay, so that seems to be working fine. So now let's go ahead and update the code so that we display the count in a label field instead of the terminal. Okay, so since we need a label widget, let's go ahead and bring the label struct into scope. And now we create a new instance of the label and add it to the layout. So this label will appear under the button widget. Okay, so we now have a label widget. So let's see what happens when we try to change the label's text from the button's click event. So as expected, we get this error message indicating that the label's been moved into the closure. So we no longer have access to the label in the outer scope, which means we can't add it to the layout. Now we can solve this by using the ref cell and the RC just like we did with the counter. But here's the thing, the label has a clone method which we can use to clone references to the label. So just to be clear, the clone method doesn't actually do a deep copy clone. It just clones the reference to the label. Okay, so now we can move the label clone into the closure and use that to set the label's text. So now the code should compile fine. So let's go ahead and run it and make sure it works. Okay, so that's working fine. We can see that the button is updating the label. Now, before we move on to the next part of the video, which is how to build a UI from an XML document, let's return back to the code and see how we can improve the state management code. Okay, so one of the issues that you might encounter when you're writing a JTK application is the usage of ref cell and RC throughout your code. Now, this will mean that you'll have to do a lot of borrowing and a lot of cloning, which will create a lot of noise in the code and make it unreadable. So to help with this issue, what you can do is create a struct that encapsulates your state variables. So the idea is that this struct will contain an inner struct, and the inner struct will be wrapped around a ref cell and an RC. And it's the inner struct that will encapsulate the state variables. 
OK, so to help explain this better, let's refactor the counter code. And we'll do that by creating a new struct. And using this struct, we can increment the counter value. So we'll start by creating an outer struct called state manager. And this state manager struct will contain a single field called state. And the state field is of type RC ref cell state, where state is the inner struct. And on the state manager, we will derive clone, so that when we call the clone method on the state manager, the state field itself will be cloned by the RC. And now we can go ahead and create the state struct, and this struct will contain a single field called counter, which is of type U32. So now on the state manager, we'll implement a few methods. The first method is the new method, and this method will simply return a new state manager initialized with a state. Next, we'll implement an increment method, and this method will mutably borrow the state field so that we can increment the counter. And finally, we'll implement a value method so that we can immutably borrow the state field and return the counter value. OK, so now we have a state manager which we can use to encapsulate state data, and we can use the state manager to increment the counter as well as get the counter value. So now let's go ahead and replace the RC ref cell counter code with the state manager. So all we have to do here is create a new instance of the state manager using the new method and we can provide it with our state data. So the state data here is our counter initialized with zero. And then we need to clone the state manager using the clone method and this will internally clone the state using the RC. So now we have a clone we can pass to the closure. And now finally in the closure we can call the increment method on the clone and this will increment the value. And then to get the value and display it in the label we can call the value method. So using this approach, we can hide the usage of RC and ref cell inside a struct. And so it just makes our API a little bit more concise and we don't have to call the borrow mode or borrow methods everywhere in our code. We can also add additional state fields and mutate those fields through the state manager. So this means again, we don't have to have individual variables with their own RC and ref cell. Okay, so now let's move on and see how we can build a UI from an XML file. Now using an XML file has an advantage in that we don't have to programmatically type all the widgets that we want and add them to containers. So sometimes you might have a layout that contains a lot of nested containers such as a box container. And doing this programmatically would be a very tedious task and if not time consuming as well as just headache inducing. Now unfortunately the XML structure has its own challenges and we'll get into that in a moment. For now though let's clear some of this code and bring the builder struct into scope so that we can load the XML document. So we can use the builder struct to load an interface from an XML document as well as from a string. So here we're going to use the from file method to load an XML document. Now this layout file doesn't exist yet, so let's go ahead and create it. And I'm going to create this file in the root directory of the project. So this is what the basic structure of a UI file looks like. And this structure contains a few widgets. And widgets are represented by the object tag, where the class name is the name of the widget. So you can see that the first object is a JTK application window. And notice that it has an ID attribute. So we can use the ID attribute to get a reference to the widget in our Rust code. And we'll see how to do that in just a moment. We can also specify widget properties by using the property tag. So here you can see that the application window has a title and a default height and width. Now object elements can have child elements. So here in the code you can see that the application window has one child element, which is a box layout. And the box object itself has two child elements, a button and a label, and each have their own IDs. Okay, so now let's take a look at how to access these widgets from the Rust code. So to access a widget from the layout file, all we have to do is call the object method on the builder and specify the widget ID. So here we're getting the application window using the object method and once we have the window we then have to bind it to the application. And once we've done that all we have to do is to show the window. So as you can see building a UI from an XML document greatly helps to reduce on the tedious task of programmatically creating widgets. And here's a demo of an application that I put together using some of the topics that we discussed in this video. So if you'd like to check out the demo you'll find the link in the description and until next time I'll see you all on the next video.